to provide some context and the essential storyline of it for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it. Um, if you haven't, you want to be looking out for this distinctive uh, raven. Is it a raven, Grace? It's a vulture, I think. A vulture. I, I don't know my big bird. It's a vulture. But, yeah, I need to learn my big bird. But you want to be looking out for this, this uh, cover on bookshelves if you want to read the book. Um, then I'm going to pose some questions and some provocations to Grace. I'm sure she'll forgive me for playing devil's advocate at times uh, in the spirit of debate. And we'll open it up for, for public Q&A for the last 20, 25 minutes or so. And I believe that you're unable to unmute yourselves. So if you want to pose a question, you need to do it through the, uh, the chat uh, or Q&A function on your Zoom interface. So without further ado, um, Grace, do you want to give us a, an overview of your book? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, James, for that introduction. Um, and yeah, as James said, you can get the book from all good bookstores, uh, but also um, if you have issues around accessibility, there is an audiobook version, uh, which I have recorded myself. So you can listen to my voice, <laughs> whether or not that is a, a selling point, I don't know, uh, but that's available on, on Audible as well. Um, so yeah, I'll just kind of briefly go over the uh, the main kind of arguments of the book. Um, I will try and do this as briefly as possible. Um, and then we can, we can, as James said, have a little bit of a, a deeper discussion and perhaps talk a little bit about how some of these arguments relate to what's going on at the moment. Um, the kind of the, the thesis of the book is really that to understand um, the development of capitalism, you have to understand the kind of historical development of um, the balance of power between different classes uh, in the UK. And, well, it, you know, around the world, but this particular book focuses on the UK. Um, as kind of illustrative of some of the other trends that have taken place within global capitalism over the last 40 years. Um, and when I talk about classes, you know, there's a, a lot of different um, ways that people understand this term class. It has a lot of different kind of cultural meanings. What I'm talking about here is really a, a kind of objective social relationship rooted in the production process. This is a kind of Marxist understanding of class. And it's basically, do you have to sell your labor power for a wage, in which case, yes, you are you know, part of that labor category with a small L, or do you own the means of production? So own the things that are needed to produce uh, the, the goods and services that we, uh, that we enjoy, in which case you are in that, that category of, of capital. Um, and so you know, this is, um, I suppose this, um, this relationship and the balance of power between these two groups can be quantified by looking at metrics like, for example, the, the labor versus the capital share of national income. Um, and the story of, uh, of the book is reflected in many ways by the, the way in which that balance um, has, ha has gone up and down in recent years. Now we're living in an age today where the uh, labor share of national income has fallen quite substantially. I think that you can argue reflects that this disparity of power between the people who own the stuff and the people who work for a living. Um, but the book really looks back um, kind of beyond, uh, well, far beyond the financial crisis, uh, sorry, before the financial crisis, um, to assess the foundations of the kind of growth model uh, that the British economy has um, been characterized by since the kind of 1980s. And I call that growth model finance-led growth. Uh, so I look at the foundations of that model, um, at the model that preceded it, and um, how, uh, how the nature of British capitalism. I then look at the financial crisis and the way in which capitalism has changed since then and make some arguments about um, how we might think about uh, transforming or even moving beyond uh, capitalism through some kind of non-reformist reforms, that is changes to policy that don't just try and kind of fix uh, superficial problems, but actually get, get to that issue of the balance of power between these two classes and, and shift it the other way. So the book starts uh, with an analysis of what was called kind of the golden age of capitalism, uh, which was that period in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, the several decades after the Second World War, where you had um, a rising labor share of national income, you had falling inequality, you had you know, fairly strong economic growth in frequent um, financial crises. Um, and 
yes, as I said, this is a, a kind of a period that, that economists refer to as the golden age of capitalism. And it was obviously founded on this idea of the post-war consensus, which was based around the kind of insights from Keynesian economic policy that the state would step in to backstop demand when uh, the private sector was unable or unwilling to do so in the case of economic downturns. Effectively, that meant that the state was there to backstop employment. Uh, as well as uh, undertaking various measures to constrain the power of, of finance. Um, and obviously there was this corporatist relationship between organized labor, the state and, uh, and business. And all of this was backstopped and reinforced by various changes that had taken place at the international level through the Bretton Woods system. And I look at, at that and the kind of changing nature of globalization uh, in, quite in depth in the book. Um, but yeah, I won't touch too much on that now because I could talk about that particular subject for a very long time. Perhaps we can come back to it later. So um, I, I then look at how this particular regime of growth, which is basically a regime that was characterized by um, relatively more equal balance of power between labor and capital than at uh, previous points during the, the history of capitalism, particularly compared to the, the pre uh, the pre war period where you'd obviously had the kind of gilded age of capitalism as opposed to the golden age very high levels of inequality um, and ultimately leading up to the Great Depression. Um, so I look at the kind of the way in which this model emerged from, from the, the, uh, the collapse of that model and the associated chaos that it brought with it, and then try and analyze the kind of the contradictions or problems that characterized uh, the, the golden age of capitalism and the Keynesian consensus that underpinned it. Um, so this really uh, requires looking at some of the changes that took place in British political economy throughout the 1970s and 80s. What you start to see in the 1970s is when some of these changes start to take place in uh, the um, Bretton Woods system that governs um, globalization, well, that governs globalization. Um, you also begin to see uh, throughout this period um, a kind of increase in the mobility and therefore the power of capital. Uh, and particularly an increase in um, in uh, the, the mobility of uh, of um, well an increase in the kind of uh, interconnectedness of the international financial system. Um, and I look in detail at the role played by um, the euro dollar market and kind of undermining the controls on capital mobility that had previously uh, kind of hemmed in the power of, of finance um, based on this kind of this uh, this Keynesian consensus. Um, so throughout this period, you start to see a kind of growth in the uh, power of, of capital, in particular financial capital, relative to labour. And then in the 1970s, you get this, this big crisis driven by uh, the first oil price spike, the stagflation crisis, that ultimately pushes these um, distributive questions about who gets most of the gains from growth. Is it workers or is it owners? And pushes these questions to the fore. And that's when you start seeing a massive increase in you know, industrial action, you get the stagflation crisis, the winter of discontent, all of these political issues associated with um, the, uh, I suppose, um, the unveiling of the kind of inherent contradictions that emerge from the class basis of this model uh, coming to the fore. Now, it's during this period where you have this much more overt struggle between workers and owners that the foundations of the kind of the new model are lame. Now you get the emergence of, well, you get the election, sorry, of, of Margaret Thatcher in 1979. And after that point, I kind of look at the book at the ways in which uh, Thatcher kind of affects a, a kind of revolution from above aimed at rebalancing power between different classes in society. Um, and I won't go in again to too much detail here because I'm already like not nearly far enough through uh, my elevator pitch. And, uh, and I know we've had, we've had quite a bit of time already, but um, effectively I look at the role of Thatcher, Thatcherism in creating kind of internationalized, financialized form of capitalism in the UK that seemed uniquely productive because of the, the level of profits that generated, but actually proved to be based on a bubble uh, in, um, in real estate and uh, driven by um, financial globalization. Obviously, that uh, bubble ultimately burst in subprime mortgage markets in the US. But you see similar dynamics relating to the interconnection between uh, lending by financial institutions, speculation over real estate, and uh, consumer debt and consumer borrowing evident in the UK. And of course, throughout this period, um, you see a massive increase in, uh, in all forms of private debt, so corporate debt. Um, household debt and the debt held by, uh, by, by banks and financial institutions. 
Um, and I argue look, that the, the proliferation of debt had a very particular political purpose. Um, so you began to see financialization affecting various different areas of, of the economy. And in the book, I take each different area of the, of, of the economy, each different kind of sector, I suppose, according to the Keynesian model, which is firms, consumers, the state. And I look at the way in which financialization affected each of these. So you have the financialization of the firm, which is associated with the kind of um, the ideology of, of shareholder value maximization, where firms begin to focus much more on their share prices, uh, often taking out large amounts of debt to, for example, buy back their own shares, um, pay out large dividends or uh, undertake mergers and acquisitions as an activity, which has ultimately led us to have a very, um, not just financialized, but actually very concentrated form of, of capitalism that we have today. That um, mode of corporate governance is also associated with falling investment on the one hand, so falling productive investment, firms putting money into kind of speculation rather than, than making things safe, and also falling wages. So a kind of internal redistribution within the firm from workers, uh, in particular to shareholders, but also to an extent to managers as well. Um, and uh, associated al alongside that, so you see a kind of rise uh, uh, in corporate debt um, as part of that, uh, that financialization of the firm. At the same time, you also see, and this is probably the, the most uh, politically significant element of, uh, of financialization, is that you see the financialization of the household associated with what is known amongst political economists as a regime of privatized Keynesianism. So rather than having the state step in to backstop demand when you have the, the, the downturn of the economic cycle, um, households are encouraged to take out debt in order to backstop demand in the context of a falling labor share of national income. So as uh, a greater share of national income is accruing to, uh, to owners rather than workers, um, and obviously that has implications for, uh, for demand, um, given the kind of the fact that wealthier people, the people who own capital are, are much less likely to consume every extra bit of income that they have. Inequality tends to be associated with kind of falling demand. This is a classic Keynesian argument. Um, the role of private debt becomes really central in backstopping uh, household consumption in the context of falling wages. And this is also associated with um, the asset, uh, the, the various kind of asset bubbles that emerge um, in equity markets, in particular in housing markets, where you begin to see obviously a you know, massive increase in mortgage lending associated with rising house prices, rising house prices associated with a wealth effect that makes consumers feel uh, better off, that encourages them to do things like release the equity from their homes uh, in order to spend more. And you get this kind of uh, you know, this cycle that we're, we're very familiar with um, that took place in many economies around the world, the UK, the US, Iceland, Spain, where you have the combination of rising household debt um, rising house prices and a current account deficit, which effectively means money is being sucked into that economy um, from the rest of the world. Um, and uh, then I look at the financialization of the state. So obviously, you know, you would expect um, the state to kind of step in um, in order to uh, to kind of curb some of these risks that were obviously emerging in the financial system as this uh, these changes took place. Instead, you saw a financialized state which was much more focused on kind of safeguarding the interests and the profitability of the finance sector um, and actually introducing uh, kind of the logic of financialization into the, the running of the state itself, into public services and into uh, particularly kind of big infrastructure projects through uh, you know, the private financing initiative, which obviously were another form of privatized Keynesianism in that they're substituting um, public spending for uh, for private investment invest uh, for uh, private um, spending generally undertaken by uh, private investors and obviously we know now that PFI has been effectively been a huge giveaway from the taxpayer to those investors that undertook that financing and what I argue in the book is effectively that, that this whole model so the financialization of uh, of the firm of households of the state there's also an element of international trade there, but that's a bit more complicated. We can maybe talk about that later. Um, but this model collapsed in the financial crisis um, so that this wasn't just an international banking crisis, but the financial crisis actually stemmed from um, the, uh, the kind of uh, political economic um, relationships that had come to govern, yes, British capitalism, but also American capitalism, as I said, kind of banish um, much of European capitalism. Um, and uh, the dynamics of financial globalization. Um, 
So what you end up with is a kind of inherently unstable form of political economy that is associated with the continuous uh, falls in the labor share of national income alongside uh, cycles of asset price inflation and, and speculation that serve to conceal the underlying problems that this model generates, particularly falling productive investment and, as I said, a, a kind of falling labor share of national income. Um, so, uh, I might, I might jump in there, Grace. Yeah, you, you jump in there, sorry, because I lost my place anyway. because <laughs> yeah, I think you've given, a, you've given a fantastic overview of um, kind of the lion's share of the book, which is this diagnosis of what's happened um, in the post-war period to, to date or to, to the crash. And uh, we might just start with a couple of questions about that bit, and then we can focus on some of the solutions that you offer as well and um, some of the contemporary uh, ideas that they relate to. Um, so I suppose my, my first question is a bit of a, a theoretical one, and it it concerns the, the major protagonist in your book, which is this idea of financialization. Um, and in the book, you, you a number of times argue that financialization is a, a kind of a whole new system of capitalism. And that all capitalists, whether they're industrial or not, have become rentiers in some respect. And my question really is whether this is true and the reasons for that uh, are kind of as follows. So, it seems to me that even before the crisis and since, big corporations like GM, Amazon, uh, Google, Microsoft, they continue to make the vast majority of their income from selling commodities. So in that kind of classic Marxist sense, they're creating and hoarding surplus value um, through exploiting labor and not necessarily through uh, financialized theft or what you know Marx liked to call the, that profit of alienation, just transferring wealth that's already been created. So, so my questions to you are twofold. One is, given, given that context, is financialization as kind of as hegemonic and as, as new and as much of a classical, a departure from classic capitalism as you claim? And does potentially a focus on, on finance as the enemy of the people or labor distract us from traditional um, and possibly still more relevant critiques of those you know, those, those nice productive capitalists like Amazon who simply exploit our labor. What do you think? Yeah, so I'll start with the second question. And I think as you will have noticed, as I was going through the book, I basically skipped over all the things that related to globalization and kind of international, um, international uh, political economy. Um, and there's a reason for that, which is that you really can't understand, you know, there is a way of, of characterizing the changes that took place in, uh, in the growth models of, uh, countries like the US and the UK from the 1980s onwards that um, you know, looks purely at domestic changes and says this happened, this happened, this happened. But to really be able to explain those changes, you have to analyze what's going on at the level of the world system. Um, the difficulty is, is that this is very complicated. Um, I think to kind of give a, a general overview of, uh, of, um, of how I think this works, I would basically, you, you have to start with effectively what you were saying, which is that it's definitely true that the vast majority of businesses still do generate uh, their profits through the sale of commodities, you know, what we would describe as kind of traditional, um, uh, the traditional activities of, of, of uh, capitalists. And in fact, this is really important because if everyone had just turned into a rentier, then no new value would be being created. There would be no real sustainable economic growth to speak of because you'd just be, you know, effectively red uh, simply means that uh, capital, capitalists are moving away from, from production and towards um, uh, a kind of feudalistic logic of extraction, basically, where you're not really creating anything new, you're just changing the, um, the, the patterns according to which existing value is distributed. Um, so, you know, you can think of uh, big monopolies, for example, that are able to charge consumers higher prices. They are simply taking you know, uh, income away from consumers and, and hoarding it themselves and not creating anything you know, particularly productive in that process. Or you can think of uh, landowners, for example, when land prices rise and, uh, and, and tenants have to pay more in the form of rent. Um, so that kind of logic of, of, uh, of rent realization, which is really central to financialization, is not the whole story. It's an increasingly important part of the story for the political economies of various countries in the global north, but it's founded on a transformation that takes place at the global level. And um, to understand the way in which the dynamics of what's called financial globalization play into financialization in the global north, you have to look at um, uh, 
effectively the relationships between various different countries current and financial accounts so basically capital flows and trade flows and investment flows between different economies and what you start to see from the 1980s onwards is uh that certain countries actually the most financialized economies uh come to uh, exhibit really big current account deficits large and persistent current account deficits that um, neoclassical economists say shouldn't exist. Basically, a country shouldn't be able to run a big current account deficit because if it does, capital's flowing out, which means its currency should depreciate, which means its goods should become more competitive, which means people should buy more of them. This didn't happen in a bunch of, a bunch of economies before the crisis in the USA, most, most obviously, but also in the UK, which arguably had one of the most overvalued currencies in the run up to, uh, to the financial crisis than anywhere else in the world. This is because lots and lots of money from other parts of the world was flowing into our financial markets, was flowing into British assets, basically, whether that's real estate, equities, whatever, in part because of the, the bubble dynamics that characterized the economy at that, that time that kind of really uh, increased returns. Now, obviously, the big question is, where was that capital coming from? Now, a lot of it was coming from other parts of Europe, which were more traditionally kind of productive. So Germany, for example, exports a huge amount of capital over that period, as do uh, as do many other states in the Eurozone. China is a really important, uh, important part of this as well, um, as are many other uh, economies in, uh, in emerging markets. And I mean, really, you know, teasing out the relate these, you know, really complex relationships between trade flows on the one hand, investment flows and investment flows on the other hand um, is is very complicated because even when you're looking at net positions, so, you know, deficits versus surpluses, you're actually concealing often a lot of subtleties that are taking place beneath the surface. What we can say is basically there are a lot of very financialized economies that were importing capital from a lot of other places where those economies were effectively still based on standard commodity production. And basically what this represents is imperialism and financialization is really founded upon these imperialistic relationships that govern the global economy. And they work in two ways. So the more traditional way is that you have big multinational enterprises headquartered in the global north. They invest in production in the global south and they repatriate their profits to the global north. Um, but the other way, and this is the way that's become more prevalent under financialization, is that even those profits that are generated in emerging markets end up being sucked into capital markets, well, asset markets in, uh, in core countries. Um, and you know, often actually um, via tax havens and um, and, uh, and, and those kind of more extractive methods facilitated by, um, by the financial systems in, um, in the core countries. The, uh, the city of London, for example, has been identified as the, one of the most significant um, facilitators of, of tax avoidance uh, in the world. Um, and you know, basically sub-Saharan Africa loses three times more every year in, in capital flight than it gains in development aid. So you can see how these kind of ways of these uh, mechanisms of extraction replicate themselves. Uh, so yeah, I think that is really important. It's not to say that commodity production has ceased to be important and it's been replaced by this kind of logic of rentierism. It's saying that the rentierization of uh, financialized economies in the global north, which does undoubtedly take place, is I suppose funded by, you could say, financed by um, commodities production elsewhere in the world. And effectively that basically what that means is hyper exploitation further down the value chain in order to um, generate higher profits further up the value chain. Um, and this is really, you know, you can see this throughout uh, kind of enterprises, um, whether you look at the dynamics of production at different parts of the value chain, as I was saying, or even just the relationships that take place within the firm between workers that are still producing things at the very bottom and executives and shareholders. Um, yeah, because of because of those dynamics of uh, of the uh, you know the relative power of capital and labor. Oh, I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. <laughs> there we go, unmuted. Um, uh, we, we, so this is all fascinating and obviously it echoes a lot of what you explain in the book. Um, but to, to the extent that you, you know, you're talking about uh, financialization as partly driven by this kind of global uh, imperialism of sorts, um, I wonder whether we also need to reassess some of the claims in the book that capitalism post-crisis, post-2008, uh, no longer has any room to maneuver. Because by the logic of what you're saying, is it possible that actually capital... Uh, and in the context of a global class struggle, 
could capital restabilize its relationship with northern labor uh, in, in the global north simply by deepening its exploitation of labor in the global south? Yeah, so this is a really interesting point, actually, because I think the optimism that I finished the book with probably for readers today is, is a bit jarring. Um, and it is actually even jarring for me um, thinking about just the changes that have happened literally over the last six months um, that have, I think, shaken quite a lot of the things that I initially thought um, were possible in terms of um, the ability of this uh, this this model, the ability of, of elites to adapt, um, given the massive fragilities that have emerged in in global capitalism and in particular economies, especially. Um, so you know, the, the I kind of end the book by talking about the massive contradictions that have emerged in the British and indeed the global economy since the financial crisis. So you've had a massive increase in corporate debt. Uh, corporate debt even before the uh, the pandemic um, was uh, people in, in, have described it in the US and the UK as, as a bubble waiting to burst. Um, you also had uh, a dramatic increase in leverage in basically every sector in the Chinese economy, which effectively is spent Chinese spending is effectively what had uh, had uh, relieved the world of the impact of the recession after the financial crisis. Uh, you had these massive fragilities that were emerging in the Eurozone in which it didn't look like there was the political will to solve. Um, and you had this kind of, you know, constant question, um, which is after, you know, in the context of the rise of China, but also the relatively um, disappointing performance of the other BRICs um, and the mints that investors were placing so much hope on in the, the, the kind of period before and immediately after the financial crisis, you start to think, where's future global, gro glo uh, global growth going to come from? And when you add into that, the fact that you're seeing, you know, stagnation in productivity and unprecedented stagnation in productivity all over the global north, then you start to think, right, okay, it looks like there are some really structural issues that we have to, we have to think about here. And indeed, even, you know, mainstream economists identify these problems too. They have this secular stagnation thesis when they're saying, demographic aging, technological change is slowing down. There aren't, basically, there aren't enough uh, profitable opportunities for investment at the moment, given the amount of savings, amount, the amount of kind of capital that there are swashing around in, in the global economy. Um, and this disparity between, you know, it's very simplistic to think about it in terms of, you know, a pot of savings and a pot of investment, but effectively there's a lot of capital seeking out returns because inequality is high, because, you know, profits, particularly amongst banks and uh, big, multinational monopolistic corporations are very high and at the same time because demand is low because productive investment is low because consumer spending is constrained because there's this massive debt overhang there isn't a level of demand the economic fundamentals that would give you those returns that that capital would require over the long run don't exist so for all those reasons you know you're kind of in the position where you're like right okay is something is going to happen to upset this very very delicate balance and obviously with the coronavirus something has happened, it did happen. And, you know, initially it looked as though we were really going to kind of potentially tip over the edge. If you had all those corporations with all those very high levels of debt defaulting all at once, that is like an existential threat to global capitalism. And yet it was the state again that adapted. I mean, you look like you, you want to ask me something on the back yeah, of that, I, so I'll I, let you go first. I, I love the passion with each answer as well. And I know that you could you could, you could keep going, but I, for the sake of making sure we've got some time for q and I'm going to jump in. And we will come back to, to COVID if we have time. Um, yeah. But you know, we're talking about all these problems, but in the book, you propose solutions through a model of what you call democratic socialism. And you also distinguish this from the social democracy of that kind of post-war consensus um, and, and post-war years. And so I wondered for, um, for, the, for the benefit of uh, listeners who, who haven't read the book yet, whether you could describe what that democratic socialism looks like in possibly as, as brief, brief uh, a way as yeah. <laughs> and, and clarify how, how it is different from the social democracy of those post four years. Yeah, right, I will be very brief. <laughs> so really the difference here comes down to ownership. And again, coming back to that thing that I mentioned at the very beginning, that the, you know, the foundation of, um, of the difference between the two major classes in capitalism basically rests on ownership of the means of production 
the difference between social democracy, which is this kind of basically Keynesian framework that aims to um, minimize some of the um, uh, inequalities that are generated by capitalism, um, as opposed to democratic socialism, which aims to change the structures of ownership in order to basically um, kind of remove or significantly reduce that distinction between labor and capital, what I call people who live off work versus people who live off wealth. Um, and that means not just, you know, investing public services, giving everyone a UBI, all those things that are kind of favorites of progressives, what called progressive kind of left liberals all around the world, actually means taking a step further, which is actually to say, um, firstly, we need to socialize and democratize ownership of the most important assets in our society. So that means land, it means the financial system, it means some of the biggest corporations, it certainly means the kind of uh, transport, energy system, utilities, the things that we really need for our economy to function and to run those democratically. So to have, um, uh, whether it's, you know, in the case of public services, service users very strongly engaged in decision-making in, um, in those, uh, those institutions, or if it's in uh, big corporations, maybe thinking about worker ownership, maybe thinking about elected boards, uh, basically kind of democratizing, extending the, the principles of political democracy into the realm of the economy. Um, and alongside that, it also involves, and this is actually something that I'm working on at the moment uh, more than, uh, than actually than I talk about in the book, is it requires democratic planning. So democratic ownership and democratic planning of the economy. Um, and interestingly enough, again, coming back to what's going on now, I'll say very briefly, we're already starting to see this because of the massive interventions that states around the world are undertaking in their domestic economies. Effectively, we don't really live in a kind of free market competitive capitalism anymore. We live in a, a monopolistic and financialized, also B state planned capitalism where central banks target asset prices, governments bail out banks, they support corporations, prevent them from going under those kind of market forces that are supposed to you know, create efficiency through creative destruction are gone. So we live under this regime of planning, but it's planning in the interests of a very, very small elite. And that is, I think, the real central issue is how do we get to a system where, well, yes, we're planning the economy, but we're doing so in a way that is representative of the interests of the majority of people. James, I think you're muted again. I've got to keep, I've got to stop doing that. <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to make sure there's no uh, there's no feedback for people listening. <laughs> um, yeah, so you, you propose all that you know there's some of these wonderful ideas ranging from national investment bank, um, public asset manager, all these aspects of, of this democratic socialism you just explained. And in rationalising this, you also uh, kind of you forge this natural union between uh, Keynesianism, Keynesianism and vari variants of it and Labour, uh, as in, in the Labour Party, and then a kind of Hayekian. Uh, neoliberalism and conservatism. And you argue, and I think it's one of the great quotes from the book, that intellectuals will always seek out the powerful to sponsor their ideas, and the powerful will always seek out ideas to justify their interests. So uh, a slightly provocative question for you then, um, and, and maybe this includes you, who are the, the intellectuals that are influencing today's or tomorrow's political economy, and who's funding them? Very provocative. I'm so glad you picked up that quote, actually, because I, I quite like that one and no one else, because it's so theoretical, no one kind of okay. really pays attention. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think what's been really interesting about the last four years, perhaps one of the greatest successes are for the left over the last four years, and obviously there have been a lot of failings alongside, has been the generation of this really quite vibrant uh, mm -hmm. and expansive ecology of organizations working to construct uh, alter like policy alternatives uh, that don't you know, deliver socialism. You can't really deliver socialism through policy, but which certainly figure out creative ways to try and shift the balance of power in society away from capital and towards labor. Um, so, you know, you've got lots of new think tanks emerging, think tanks like Commonwealth, for example, um, autonomy, um, obviously the kind of, uh, I suppose, the slight more, more radical uh, thinking amongst more, some of the more traditional think tanks like IPR and NEF as well. Um, mm. And alongside that, you have uh, trade unions, lots of NGOs and academics working very closely. And it has been up until now, they've often been working very closely 
within the Labour Party. You know, the Labour Party has been putting on conferences and, uh, and sponsoring kind of roundtables and things to try and get experts together to say, how do we solve this particular problem? Um, and I think, you know, there's been so many ideas over the last four years as to how we, we change capitalism. Um, a lot of them really creative um, and really, really interesting. I mean, obviously, the best example is probably the Green New Deal and the raft of policy papers that have come out and all the campaigning associated with it as to how we delivered that. Um, but I think that's replicated across kind of all policy areas, really. And it does seem today, like in many ways, the intellectual project has proceeded much faster than the, um, the, the, the projects on the ground at the grassroots that the, the basically... Um, the, the rest of the movement. So we have all these amazing ideas, but we don't really have a powerful, organized um, uh, set of, you know, unions, uh, activists, um, campaigning organizations that can really go out to bat for some of these, these ideas. And, and in many ways, that's kind of uh, one of the, the big failing, failings of the, the Corbyn era is that brilliant ideas, not enough uh, organizing. And, 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 and I want to pick up on that slightly. And um, I can't, just for the person who's, who's posted a question, I can see the Q&A in the chat and we will come to it. I'm just going to pose two quick questions to Grace before we do. Um, the first one is on this idea of the failing of the left. So I'm sure it's a question that you've posed, that's been posed to you before, but I'm wondering to what extent does this vision of a, a social, social, uh, a democratic, the democratic socialist agenda in the UK, how, to what extent has that potentially died with the Corbyn project. Um, you know, the, the casual and tuned in reader of your book will note that lots of the, the things you propose were also featured in the Labour Manifesto in 2017 and in 2019. But you know, if we, we're looking at the kind of the political success of these ideas, well, Labour have only won three of the, uh, of the last 10 elections and mm -hmm. Blair, who you, you strongly critique as complicit in finance led growth in the book was at the helm for all, you know, all three of those. So I wondered, what does this say, especially given that a very different political program that, that you do rightly critique has won successful elections, what does that say about the state of British politics and the general preferences of, of the British public and by implication the future of, of your vision for the Labour Party and the future of the British state? I don't think you can read everything that you might think you can from um, pure electoral politics over the last three decades, say. And I think the main reason for that is this is something, this is a book that I'm constantly citing. I should probably get in touch with the authors and tell them that I've increased their sales loads. But there's a book by two academics from Oxford, um, Jeff Evans and James Tiley, called The New Politics of Class, The Political, Political Exclusion of the British Working Classes. Basically, they look at how actually, ever since the 1997 election, the working classes have actually been dropping out of the electorate en masse until we get to a point today where more people don't vote than vote and that whether or not you vote is significantly correlated with your um, your class identity. Uh, and I think that's really the, you know, there's loads of other stories that are, that are taking place in electoral politics over the last 40 years. Thatcher creates this class of, of homeowners and uh, people who are invested in the stock markets who see themselves as mini capitalists. So tend to you know, side much more with the right wing. Home ownership becomes a much more significant factor as a result of that. Age becomes a much more significant factor as a result of home ownership. But for me, the biggest issue here is the fact that so many people now simply don't vote in large part because they think they're all the same. And this was of course driven by an electoral strategy under Blair that explicitly said, well, it doesn't matter what these people think because they have nowhere to go. Really the task of the left today is not simply winning over people who voted Tory, although it obviously is partly that, it is also winning over people who are so disenfranchised, so, so disillusioned that they've really ceased to get engage in electoral politics um, altogether. And what you always hear from these people is that there's no point in voting. I'm not going to give my vote to these people. They don't deserve it because they're all the same. Uh, and I think the real tragedy is that in 2017, a lot of these people turned out to vote because they were like, this guy's a bit different. And then for me, at least in part, because of the kind of arming and arming over Brexit, because of what seemed like triangulation, everyone was, you know, who initially believed in, in the fact that this guy could be a little bit different was like, oh, he's just the same as all the other ones, right? These kind of triangulating, um, inauthentic politicians uh, who basically represent the interests of the ruling classes. 
Um, and, you know, so on that basis, I think there is definitely hope for this project. And I think it basically relies on generating a level of support amongst that disenfranchised population um, and transforming that into a, a kind of, you know, energy to transform the, uh, the status quo. Mm. Hope is a good thing. That's, that would be a nice note to mm. end. I, I've got one more question before we go to the public Q&A. And that's really um, whether the, the 2008 crisis, the COVID crisis, the kind of um, this interregnum period that you call it, really is the death throes of, of capitalism. Because for me, looking at you know, the state of society a decade after the crash, income inequality is at record highs, you know, profits mm -hmm. and proportion of national income are, are post-war highs and trillions remain offshore in, in tax havens. So, I mean, I, I wonder whether it's possible that from your perspective, whether capital's drive for accumulation could actually destroy the planet before it destroys capitalism. Um, and in turn, if we think of crises of capitalism really as more uh, of, a, of a historical process where the existence of capitalism itself is threatened by social political forces, is there a, a legitimate social political force in the foreseeable future that is, is going to pose a real existential threat to capitalism? I think what we can say without doubt is that um, the kind of stable, moderate politics of, say, the kind of pre-crisis period mm. is, is over. So we will increasingly see what we will continue to see um, a, a polarization of, of electoral politics, of, of opinions, uh, of, uh, you know, um, opinions on the economy, on culture, on all these various different things. And that that is a process that is going to be driven by the increasing difficulty, um, well, the, the increasing difficulties that capitalism as a system will have in uh, producing the, the kind of increases in living standards that were seen uh, throughout, you know, the post-war period and throughout the, the 1980s and 90s. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, often I think people on the left assume that when crises take place, that's the point at which uh, support for the status quo uh, erodes most substantially. But actually, it is time, it's a kind of long periods of stagnation that are most likely to be associated with a real decline in support for the status quo and historically revolutions. This is something that mm. Tocqueville points out um, when he is uh, he's looking at everything that's going on throughout Europe in the 1840s. He says that the biggest issue here is uh, the fact that people don't think that things are going to get better for them. And that actually, it's a prolonged period of stagnation rather than just a crisis that is uh, the most dangerous to um, to elites. So on that front, there's definitely going to be going to be increasing support for change. I think that is something that we can definitely count on. The question is, is what, uh, how, you know, what form that will take. And of course, it's just as likely to benefit the far right as it is the left. Uh, this is obviously something that we have been seeing everywhere, really, uh, and particularly throughout the global north um, in the period since the financial crisis. And actually, things like climate change, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic, could accelerate um, the, the, the transition of support from the center and from the left to the right, because you know there is this kind of climate nationalism at the moment that's saying, well, people are gonna want to come here as the oceans rise, let's make sure that we really enforce very um, restrictive migration policies now to prevent that from happening. So even though there are things that are happening that we would assume would automatically lead people to support the left, things like climate change, um, you know, there, there is absolutely no guarantee that that is what will happen. And you're quite right that actually, you know, there's a, I think there's a point in the book at, at which you talk about um, the kind of Marxist understanding of, of, of contradictions and uh, contradictions within capitalism um, and how there's this long view that ultimately because of the declining organic composition of capital, the rate of profit will eventually fall, at which point the system becomes so structurally weak that the workers are able to overthrow it, yada, yada, yada. And it's like you don't even have to um, challenge that idea just to say, what if the planet literally 
is underwater before that can even take place, which is not obviously something that I think we've probably wrapped our heads around yet. Um, so there are loads and loads of reasons to be pessimistic, but it's also, I just think it's, you know, the duty of people who want to fight for a better, better world to see the potential for positive change and organize to make it happen, because what else are we going to do? <laughs> Uh, I, again, the hope is uh, the hope is very uh, it's good to hear, but also that you know the whole problems of far right populism they could fill an entire festival of debate online program mm. in themselves, couldn't they? So we won't go down that rabbit hole now because I'm aware that lots of members of, uh, of the audience want to ask questions. So if I uh, read out maybe two at a time, Grace, is that okay? Yeah, that works. Uh, just so that we can get through as many as possible in the next um, ten, maybe fifteen minutes, if people are willing to to stick around. Um, so I've got a question from, first question from Colin. Um, he says, why only two classes? The middle seem to be capitalists through personal savings, um, invested especially in property and company salary-based or private money purchase pensions that then go into the financial system through funds and markets. Mm -hmm. They also have political power and elected Thatcher and later Tory governments, um, but their situation is increasingly hollowed out and precarious. Um, so I think the, the central question there is why only two classes? Um, and then uh, we've got one from Joe, um, who says, what kind of electoral system do you think we need, Grace? And I'll let you take those. Uh, okay, so I will answer that, that first question first. Um, and I mean, basically the, the division that Marx uses and which I follow on from is a, is a theoretical one. And it's basically, as I said, about access to asset ownership, whether or not you have to sell your labor power for a living. And actually, even within Marx, you know, those are the two major classes under capitalism. But there are also others, you know, um, there are landlords, there are um, the, uh, the kind of petty bourgeoisie, there are the lumpen proletariat, although that's more controversial. Um, so. But, but I mean, basically, those are kind of what Marx argues, they're kind of remnants of, of old systems and the, the two predominant classes under capitalism are capital and labour. Now, as um, capitalism has developed, and particularly over the course of the 20th century, obviously, that relationship became much less stark in the global north, or it appeared to become much less stark in the global north because of the emergence of this kind of professional managerial class of so people who were, who were paid quite well. Um, and who could therefore occasionally be relied upon to side with capitalists as opposed to other workers. And then obviously this becomes even more complicated during the 1980s when Thatcher expands asset ownership. Um, so of both productive and non-productive assets, non-productive assets is less of an issue, but of you know, equity, so lots of people become, inv become invested in the stock market. And so are, are themselves kind of mini capitalists. So for these two reasons, kind of the emergence of a, a professional managerial class and the expansion of asset ownership, that distinction between those two groups does definitely become blurred. Um, but what I would say is that both of those trends, when looked at, you can't look at those trends in, in isolation. You have to look at what's happening at the level of the world system. And actually, with regards to the emergence of this managerial class, you aren't seeing lots of working class people becoming um, middle class and that shifting the whole nature of, uh, of, uh, of the you know, relationship between capital and labor at the global level. What you're seeing is a lot, a lot, a lot more people becoming proletarianized in the rest of the world. So the kind of growth of the working class in the global south and then the concentration of managerial roles in the imperial core. Now Marx anticipated that there would be managers under capitalism, but that managers would often uh, side with capital rather than with labor. Um, but I don't think, you know, it's not clear in Marx's work that he would ever have anticipated. And Marx, you know, himself wrote perhaps less about imperialism than later Marxist theorists, that we would get to the situation where these very well-paid workers who are effectively functionaries of, of, uh, of capital, and these can be, you know, any, anything from corporate executives and multinational corporations to middle managers, to accountants, to management consultants, to, Anyone who works in finance effectively. And these are uh, people who are either kind of managing global production or they are um, redistributing the surplus value generated in global production. So for, in, for example, finance, where you are looking at a purely kind of uh, rentier based um, system rather than one that is actually generating value. So you can kind of look at these people as kind of managers of global production. 
Um, and that does definitely change the balance, the relationship between the classes in the global north. But again, at the level of the global economy, you still really do have this massive divide, and it is between capital and labor. And even in the global north, if you take, you know, people who we could describe as capitalists plus the professional managerial class, you've got maybe 30, 35 percent of the population. Um, and it's still really the vast majority of people who not only have to sell their, their labor power for a living, but who do not really receive an adequate wage for doing so. Mm. Um, so you're right to say that it has become much more complicated, I would agree. Uh, but I still think that when you look at when you look at this at the global level, it's 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 empirically valid and that also it's very theoretically important. OK, so so on the on the electoral system one quickly before we, we take some more questions. Um, this is a difficult one. Um, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of very strong arguments for proportional representation. The difficulty is that if the government is elected on a majoritarian electoral system, they have very little incentive to change to a proportional one. Um, although it, it probably does make sense, and I think it would play a role in in in, uh, in alleviating some of that disenfranchisement um, as, as, that we've seen as people have dropped out of the electorate. A lot of them basically being like, "My vote doesn't count." So, what's the point? Brilliant. Okay, so um, two more questions. This one's from Adam. Um, he says, could solutions to increasing financialization on the back of investments in safe assets like real estate and consolidated instruments include one, socializing shareholding, and two, constraining foreign purchases of British assets? Um, that could be a complex question, so I'll let you take that and we'll move to another one afterwards. So, uh, socialising shareholding, this is actually something that you will find in my book when I talk about the, the idea for a people's asset manager, which is a, a kind of, um, yeah, I mean, it's what it says on the tin, it's, a, it's an asset manager that in, invests um, on the one hand, effectively, what you could understand as a sovereign wealth fund, so uh, a, a fund capitalized with public assets, potentially with tax revenues, basically public money that could be invested in various different areas of the economy which can be used therefore to socialize ownership because if the government is using this money to buy up equities and lots of corporations then the government becomes uh, a partial owner of those corporations um, and also i argue that this um, same system could be used to socialize and invest pension um uh, kind of the private pensions wealth um in, in a similar sort of way although there would be kind of difficulties and uh, particular issues around that that i discuss in the book um so yes, I think this is really important, but I think the key thing about it, and again, what I discuss with this idea of the people's asset manager is that um, it's not enough just to um, promote public ownership, particularly when you're doing so in such a kind of intermediated way as by saying the state has this pool and then the state invests and buys all these portions of companies, but it has to be democratic. So I argue that this people's asset manager should become really a kind of a, a really important popular vehicle um, for, uh, I suppose, like uh, elevating the voices of, uh, of ordinary people in terms of the working of the economy. So it should be subject to elections, the board should be elected, it should have stakeholders from unions, from you know, various different organizations um, supporting that decision-making process. Um, and that it should, you know, there should be lots of different ways in which it, it is made accountable to um, to ordinary people. So I think, yes, we need socialized shareholding, but we also need to make sure that uh, public ownership, whatever form it takes, is uh, is democratic. Um, oh, yeah. And the training foreign purchases of British assets, yeah, that's already happening. Um, it looks as though the government's going to introduce some restrictions on this and this is actually a really interesting point because um the massive devaluation when the pound was very valuable um it uh, obviously this was partly due to um the dynamics that i described before which was our uh, big current account deficit and uh, big inflows into into british assets um the the uk was effectively borrowing from the rest of the world and a lot of that borrowing was financed by so Britons who owned assets abroad selling those assets and foreigners buying British assets. Now, that was all premised upon basically the imperial role of the British economy. So over the course of British history, the UK, UK based investors have become very wealthy by buying things around the world. British capitalism is very, very internationalized. And that legacy persisted up until around the financial crisis. Up at, and at that point, we had this big current account deficit. It had to be financed, so a lot of assets were sold. And obviously, because of the dynamics of that, 
they were more likely to be sold in terms of the uh, the, the relative value, uh, profit that you could generate given the uh, the exchange rate at the time. Now the exchange rate has plummeted. It has become very cheap for international investors to buy British assets and much more expensive for uh, British investors to buy foreign assets. What we like to see is an erosion of that imperial position where Britain, there was an interesting article the other day saying the pound is becoming an emerging market currency. And this is basically a recalibration of, um, of effectively the UK's relationship with the rest of the world. Whereas before we had this really strong currency, we had loads of assets, you know, there was lots of money flowing into the British economy. Today, that position has been inverted. And I think that's going to be the new normal from now on, which does imply that if we want to have, um, uh, you know, if, if we want to stop this from happening, which obviously the Conservative Party are interested in doing, um, then you would you would need to to control foreign purchases of British assets. And indeed, this is, I think, something that's become going to become much more common as we see basically economic nationalism on the rise uh, all around the world. Brilliant. Thank you. Great detailed answer as well. Um, Sorry, that was probably really boring for everyone. I try not to like go into too much detail when I'm doing these. But... Uh, people who are tuning into this talk will, uh, will be here because they love exactly that stuff. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to take two more questions, Grace, on because uh, I'm conscious of the time. Um, and so maybe some, some shorter answers to these two so we can wrap up. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take one from uh, James Locke who asks, what hopes do you hold for a universal basic income and how would you recommend that activists achieve a pilot of this in the UK? So I'm actually not a massive fan of UBI and I think the reason for this is that, you know, my vision for, um, for kind of how a, a welfare system and a system of public services would work would rest on this idea of decommodification of the means of subsistence. It's basically all the things that you need to survive free at the point of use. And this is a kind of model of universal basic services that, um, that I think they were talking about a bit in the last election. Basically, I think that's better than UBI because UBI is, is still, still means that the things that you need to survive are subject to the market mechanism. You're given a pot of money. If you don't spend that money wisely, then that's your fault. And also there are issues around, I think, um, lots of disability campaigners are quite worried about it because of the um, potential that, you know, they're not going to get as much, as much money as they need to support their, their complex needs. Um, so I think really what the kind of system we should be looking towards is one where the things that you need to survive are decodified, they're not allocated through the market mechanism, they don't have prices. And um, that creates a very different stability, I think, than, than, uh, than a UBI, which is still based on this idea of, you know, individuals bumping up against other and free markets using their rational utility maximizing uh, knowledge to you know determine um, how resources are allocated and, and that and that sort of thing. I think decommodifying the things that we need to survive creates a different subjectivity which is that these are things we all own in common these are things we all need to survive they should be available to everyone regardless of how much money you have and actually that they are things that you can even put a price on. Mm. Brilliant. And the final question um, comes from uh, the wonderfully named Incognito. Um, <laughs> asks, uh, I'm curious about your version of democratic socialism that you propose as an ideal we should strive for. Most theoretical contributions that build on Marxism entail some form of revolution that will have, have to break down our current institutions to build a new framework of socialism or communism. Do you envision a revolution as part of the plan to get to socialism and, in yet, and if yes, how do we ensure it does not turn into a violent and bloody one? Yeah, this is an interesting point and one that has kind of been swept aside in recent years as there's been such a clear focus on electoral politics. But it has obviously been, as you said, something that has divided socialists for a very, very long time. Um, and actually, you know, a lot of people who, who um, initially kind of eschewed the revolutionary route ended up becoming social democrats and, and reformists so there is still this um this tension i think obviously the democratic and democratic socialism doesn't just mean it's democratic it also means that the way that you achieve it is through democratic means rather than revolutionary socialism which is achieved through revolutionary means um in terms of i, I mean i think the the, the word revolution is very difficult even to define today in a way that is tangible because the level of power concentrated in the hands of the world's largest states, military, economic, whatever, 
effectively means that it's impossible even to imagine workers in the global north being able to overthrow those states. Less the case for workers in the global south, obviously, and that is, is still potentially where you are most likely to see uh, the biggest challenge to capitalism. I think that's where you're going to see the biggest challenge to capitalism is, is coming from the global south. But in the context of not being able to do that, do we therefore give up uh, and, I don't know, like leave the global north in favour of moving to weaker states that we think we can overthrow? Or do we say, right, there's also a democratic route that we can we can take? Now, this is subject to so much contestation. Firstly, um, there is a question of whether or not uh, it is even possible to create a socialist government. So to have um, a, uh, a socialist movement that takes electoral power with the aim of transforming the nature of the capitalist state. Now, obviously this is controversial because Marxists say that the capitalist state um, is a uh, sort of epi epiphenomenon of relationships between classes is uh, part of the kind of superstructure rather than the economic base. So to change the state, you have to change the balance of power between different classes. Um, and this is actually where I think I and a lot of other people come at it from, which is to say, right, so we know that institutions reflect the balance of class power in society. So the best way to change institutions is to change the balance of class power in society. But we also know that the balance of class power in society is in part determined by those institutions. So then you have this, uh, this kind of, um, uh, this, this question really, this quite thorny question as to what comes first and how you use institutional power to shift social power and how you use social power to shift institutional power. I don't think that that is as theoretically difficult to solve as it sounds. And I think it's perhaps even easier to, well not easier, but easier to imagine how you could resolve it in practice um, because you know, we've been in this downward spiral of the falling social power of labor being reflected in um, changes to institutions that consolidate that power. And I think it is possible to imagine the reverse. So, you know, leftists gaining some power in some institutions as a result of building up movements in society, doing things like removing the trade, the uh, anti-trade union legislation, um, you know, perhaps uh, changing um, the nature of the state, so getting rid of the House of Lords, getting rid of the City of London Corporation, all of these different things that do actually have quite an important role in changing um, balance of power between the classes. And then perhaps as that process deepens, ultimately getting to this place of what Andre Gortz calls non-reformist reforms, where you can impose kind of uh, reforms to the economy democratically that shift the balance of power between labour and capital to such an extent that you end up and this is the question really is that do you do the shifting of the balance of power to end up in a place where the working classes can then undertake revolution or has it by that point become a mute question i don't know because we're not there yet but we will see <laughs> maybe we'll see it in our lifetimes who knows that's the great question to, <laughs> leave this, uh, to leave this event on um i'm sorry to those of you who were hoping we'd finish at eight we've only run over a little bit um so before... that was my fault i take far too long i'm sorry <laughs> It was great. Um, so before we go, I just want to thank uh, Citizens Advice again for sponsoring the event. Thank the organisers of the Festival Debate for including this event on their programme. Uh, thank everyone who's tuned in via Zoom or via YouTube to, to watch the discussion and hear from Grace. Everyone who asked a question, thank you. Um, and, and above all, thank you to, to Grace for giving up your time this evening to discuss the book. Um, so without further ado, uh, I wish everyone a goodbye and take care. Thanks everyone and thanks James for hosting. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.